Hi guys, well, I'm back with another reaction video, but this time it's not um, a film or um, a, a trailer. It's a docu series made by um, a, directed by a Congolese um, Congolese director and a Congolese producer. So this documentary is specifically um, directed or targeted for Congolese people. So I'm going to watch it and react to it. Hopefully, at the end of it, you guys can watch it too and give your opinions about it, okay? Right, let's get right into it. I'm just going to skip the intro because it's uh, quite long and we're going to um, get right into the questions, to the first question, so... Bang. Alright, almost there. I'm just going to take the names of the people that are present. Hello. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And yourself? I'm, I'm not bad. I'm not bad at all. All right, so we're gonna, I'm going to ask you some questions. We're going to okay. go through, you know, uh, four sections. Of Mr. Congo. So we have Mr. Berviani. Sort of, um, it was Mr. Congo in 2018. Wow. Okay. 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 Cool. So I'm going to start with the first question. My first question is, mm -hmm. what is migration to you? Okay, I'm going to stop there and uh, answer this question. What is migration to you? Migration is basically, um, for me, it's a movement from one place to another. Quite simply put, there is no, you know, A to Z about it. It's just moving from one place to another, from one country to another. That's migration, okay? But let's see what everybody else has to say about migration. Migration... Um, for me, migration is someone that moves from one never one country to another country. Like I'm moving from home to come to another to a foreign country. So for me, that's migration. Migration for me means moving from home to find a new home. Yep. Yeah. Migration to me. I like Mama Bert. <laughs> is a process where someone. A process. Decide, I'm no longer happy here. I'm nowhere well off here. I think I could be better over there. And they take that, make the decision, and actually take the step and go where they want to be. Well, there's a lot of factor in that process, though. To me, my understanding of migration is the movement of people from one place to another. Yes. To put it in simple terms. Migration is a, uh, it's a combination of things. So this is Charlene. This is uh, the producer it's just, it's human of the show. Stars. Um, you're thinking about the, the planet itself has migrated from one location, splitting into, the, into seven continents. Humans are naturally adapted to that as well and done the same thing. They just move around. No one's really from where they are from. So True. it's just a human construct. To me, is moving from one place to another in the search for Miss Congo, 2018. Or better education or better job. Just hey, girl. Religion. Migration for me is actually just moving from one place to the other. There might be a reason for it. There might be no reason to discover the world, to have a better life. Yes. It's just moving from your comfort zone to a different place, a new place. <laughs> Migration for me is when an individual does not find in in their respective country where they have hardship either it's financial or either it's um they're in danger and then they need to move from that country to come to a country that will receive them um a country that makes them feel safe um a country that you know where they can have financial gain where they can work you know, yeah, so that's what that's what I, I think migration, basically a better life, you know, that's what I think when I think of a, a immigration and I think of a migrant, um, that's what I, that's, that's what I think. Okay. Okay. As a diet. Right. 
As a diaspora, do you think it's time to go back home? This is one of my favorite questions. So what I think is, as a diaspora, I know people say diaspora, but I say diaspora because it works better for me. I can roll my tongue with the eyes, diaspora. As a diaspora, do you think it's time for us to go home? I think it's time for us to fix home. There is no going back home to the, the, you know, the shambles that we left behind. There's a reason we left home. So we need to go back and fix it. We can't just decide to go back and leave there right now into the same conditions that we left. So we need to fix it before we go back home. So no, it's not time to go back home and leave there because what, what are we going to do? We're going to live in the same situations? We can't do that. It's time for us to start fixing it because the previous generations, our parents that came before us, did not do it. Some have started, but it's not fixed. It's not the same conditions that we, what we are living in Europe. So there's no point of us deciding to go back and living in the same conditions that we escaped in the first place. It's time to fix home. It's not time to go back home yet. But let's see what everybody else has to say. Do you think it's time to go back home? Hmm, very interesting. Yes and no. Yes, because what's happening, I'm from the Congo, I'm from the DRC, what's happening in Congo now is there's so much you can do as I'm someone that goes to the, to the Congo regularly. There, there's so much markets, uh, business-wise, yep. um, that you can basically... Um, Invest in the country. How do I say this? Uh, attain, basically. There's so many businesses that you can start um, in, in Kinshasa, it's just, especially in Kinshasa. And, and also, like, in... Not just Kinshasa, though, because um, Congo is large. And Kinshasa, there's way too many people already trying to start businesses in Kinshasa. I mean, we know that Kinshasa is like a, is a melting pot for not just Congolese people, but other cultures as well. I was in Congo in 2018 last time, and everywhere I was meeting around with Polish people, Bulgarian people, Ukrainian people, Russian, Chinese, Japanese. So Kinshasa itself right now is filled with foreigners, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's already a melting pot. Which is a good thing, but when we go as Congolese people, we need to start developing outside of Kinshasa itself, like, you know, Matadi, um, Mwanda, and all these places that need to be developed. So we need to start looking at it because that's actually where the, it's the, the, the ground is still fresh, so that's where we need to start looking at. So Kinshasa is good, but we need to start looking at outside Kinshasa because Kinshasa right now is filled with foreigners, so we need to look outside of Kinshasa. In, in the whole of Congo, basically. Um, yeah. Our president, we've got a brand new president now who has different ideas and different ideologies, uh, which is quite encouraging, but he's not there yet as it's just started, which is um, a bit shaky. But I think it's a, it's a good time to go. It's a good time to go. Um, it's a good time to um, invest as well. That's the word. Um, good time to go invest. But the thing That's what I want to hear. You see. In, yeah. in, in Congo. No, <laughs> the infrastructure is well, not really well set. Because we haven't done anything about it. And um, us lot who are bought up here, I think it's going to be a culture shock for a lot of people as well. You know, who are born I think it's or... quite fun when you go to Congo and uh, the electricity goes off and you're sitting in the dark with candles and your whole family, you're sitting, you know, with your grandparents, your cousins and you're singing in the dark with candles and, and Bamunda Petrol and all that. I love it. Yes, it's, it's good to have infrastructure, but I think it's also very important for us to just think, you know what, this is our, it's our, it's our culture, it's the roots. So I would not like the idea of Congo being all the time having lights like we are in Europe. I don't know. It would be good, but I like the idea of sometimes just having it all gone off, so we could just like totally bring each other, like bring family together, and just enjoy ourselves. Because actually, what that does is it helps you disconnect from social media. So I find nothing wrong with the fact that sometimes in Congo you have no electricity. I think it's a really good thing, actually. Okay. Um, I also do think that. Um in terms of living life, day-to-day -day living in Congo, it's going to be quite difficult for a lot of the people who are bought, especially bought up here, for example. Typical example, electricity, power cuts, you know. That's going to be, that, you know, that's going to be very, you know, 
it's, it's, it's not going to be good. Really. I don't know. I quite you love know, it. For example, if you're working there or you've got a business I like being in the dark sometimes. Up. There's nothing that you can do. You have to wait. And then also the the way people think there as well. We're very quick. We're very fast, you know, when it comes to, okay, I want to do this and this is the time that you need to come, you know. things, Little things like that, you know, they're, they're very slow there as well. Um, I think there needs to be an education of um, how to be professional, you know, when it comes True. to work settings as well and they're not very professional uh, I'm afraid you know you want to organize a meeting at six o'clock they will turn up at ten o'clock yeah know? and it's an ideology that needs to be changed you know and um, yeah so it, 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 there's a lot of um, barriers but that I have known people who have gone back and who have basically overcome those barriers but it takes a while to overcome it and you know and you, you will get frustrated as well you know um yeah but um I think I wouldn't say the diaspora that depends on you as an individual how do you feel and how ready are you to go back home but it's not a question about individuality though it's the question is as a diaspora it's not as a person so as a diaspora, what are we doing? Individually, that's something else. Of course, you can choose to go back and live in, in the shambles or maybe you have money, you've got, you built your own property, you're fine. But then it'll be just you in that good situation. The rest of the country is still in shambles. So the question is not about you know, individuality. It's as a diaspora, as a community. Is it time for us to go back? Then I say it's time for us to go fix it. So I think this is not a question about you know, individuality. It's not about if I should go back or if you should go back. So I think it's good to kind of stick to that question, but okay, back to it. Like, is the situation back home okay for you to move back home? Because you don't want to move back home and then find yourself in a situation where you're not able to... Because before going back, for me... Dude, I'm sorry. If we go back, to, back home to a situation where we can't handle it, then we need to do something about it. That's the whole point of what I'm saying. It's not about individuality. So if you can you can't just decide to go back home and then decide, okay, the situation is not good, I'm gonna go back to England. You need to go and make that decision that if I cannot live in this situation, then I need to do something about it. So it's about as a community going to Congo and fixing it. It's not about individuality, it's not about, you know, whether you can just go back and decide, you know, whether it's okay for you to be there or not. It's about the community. So it's Again, it's not about an individual choice. It's about the community. Okay, I'm getting right up. And before going back home, I feel like I have to make sure the country has evaluated and the country has, there's things that change in the country and mm. I feel like comfortable and safe to be. Obviously, there's no way to be safe anyway, but I feel like home is safe. But that's for me. If anyone, if you as an individual, you're ready to go back home, then that's a choice for you to make. You know what? As a diaspora... Who has been in a foreign country for many many years you have changed your way of thinking you have amended adapted to the way i say british way you have adapted to the british way mm -hmm. so now if you think of moving back you will be moving back with a different set of mind and you will start judging those people according to where you come from you'll be like yeah but we know sis no okay to do that i mean back in london in uk they don't do that so how can you move back? You need to learn their way and then you need to combine it. There is no learning Congolese way. We already learned it. We already know it. Okay? We in this country, we still, we, even those of us that were born in, in Europe, we still speak Lingala. We listen to Congolese music all the time. We eat Congolese food. It's our roots. We already know what it is to be Congolese. So for you to go back to Congo and start judging the way of life in Congo, that's just that's a different kind of mentality because you know who you are. So when you go there, it's just about you adapting to the way of life there. Because like you say, we adapt to the way of life in the UK or in Germany or in France. When we move here, we adapt to the way of life here. So when we go back, it's all about adapting. It's not about judging, it's about adapting. It's just, it's your roots, it's who you are. You can't just say, okay, I can't go back because I'm gonna start judging people. I mean, I, I, I don't agree with that. Okay, right. We mix it together. So moving back now, going, visiting, getting to know them and coming back, yes. I think as a diaspora, yes. Should I say yes. But as an individual, that really depends on your own journey and where See? you are in life and 
what is drawing you to which direction. Something is going to take you to a certain direction. So that's on you to kind of figure out. As a people, I think it's something we definitely need to always have the, at the back of our minds that we come from somewhere. Why did we leave the somewhere? Mm-hmm. And then what's the next story after, after now? She thinks like me. I don't think there is a specific time when people should decide to go back or not to go. It's an individual decision where you feel ready enough. And I think for, uh, for us or for us as human beings, it tends to depend on the current situation and aspiration or um, the situation in where we are aspiring to go. As a diaspora for me now, yeah, it is time to go back. I think we've invested the last a thousand centuries in developing Europe, Europe. whether it be directly or forcefully. <laughs> Or indirectly, we've we've done that. We've done it very very well. Um, every now it's time to go back and build back Great home. Britain that we're on has been created um, physically by labour that came predominantly from Africa, by resources that came predominantly from Africa. So I think it's time for Africans to put that effort back to Absolutely. their own land. Yeah. Not for me. No. I'm not ready. No. Okay. For everybody else, that's an individual decision to make. It's not just because people decide to go. But the question is not about individual. Uh, does it mean it's right for you to go back as well? It's timing. So if you feel like you're comfortable moving back and you're ready, then go. But I'm not ready. Sis, the question was, as it just poor? Yes. Why not? You didn't answer the question though. Sorry, but you didn't. It's always time to go back home. It's like I leave my house today to come here. Now, at any point from the moment that I left the house to come here, I'm gonna have to go back home. See? There's not a specific time unless a time I set for myself to go home. So, is it now time? for the diaspora to get home. I think any time is a good time to go home. But the question we must also think about is that, yes, we're going to go back home now. But so what are we going to do at home? What are we going home for? Oh, with things like me. He's my friend. In my are head. Are we going home <laughs> on a holiday trip? Are we going home to do some work there? Are we going home to help our nations to advance forward? Are we going home to heal? Are we going home to share what we have with others and let others also share what they have with us so that collectively we might build together and go forward? That's right. Do communist people have a white obsession? I think there could have been a, way, uh, a better way of phrasing this, but it, 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 it's blunt, it's, it's there. It's, you know, do we have an obsession with white people? I think the answer would be, for me, it would be yes, because I think, obviously, it rises from an inferiority complex. We look up to white people for approval, you know, we are confused. We don't know whether to hate them or to love them. You know, we will criticize everything that they do, but then we will want to do things the way they do. And the person that, or in our community that do things the way white people do will praise them. So it's, it's a very confusing state of mind to be in. And we need to just take responsibility to who we are. We need to accept ourselves first and foremost. Know the difference, that we are different. We are not the same people. It doesn't matter what we look at. Yes, we're all humans, but we are not the same, OK? Obviously, when we look at each other, we can see the differences. We, have, we don't have the same skin color. That's just, you know, it's, it's, it's there. We can't say we don't see it. We see it. So with that, we need to accept that, first of all, we are different. 
and then with that we can start accepting to, we can start to accept all the, the the you know the combination of okay we at least we have this a, a same with this one we do the same this one we are, there are all these differences and we need to accept the differences first and foremost so do Congress people have uh, an obsession with white people it's a, a very unhealthy obsession because it, it's confusing state of mind so we need to kind of work on that but let's see what everybody else have to say Blame white people for all our problems. Yes. And yet we, we run, run to them. To them with them. Yes. <laughs> Plain and simple. <laughs> um, I don't know if back in the days, you know, our ancestors used to think. I think back in the days, our ancestors used to think that, oh, who are these people who look different like us? And, um, uh, you know, they, they didn't like it. And then after a while, they just start liking them because they look different, they behave different. And we're forced into liking them, sis. So, you know, a Congolese person, when I went to Congo, they said, I went to this museum and they said, Congolese people are like lizards. Mm -hmm. Le wherever they go, they adapt. What Bang, I Cynthia. You see, you say this, Congolese people are like lizards, okay? We adapt to situations. So, I'm going to go back to the question about going back home. So, if we can adapt to being in Europe and adapting to anywhere else we go, Obviously, we can adapt to going back home because home is home. Okay, I'm going to let you talk. So they, they adapt and they become like that, they're integrated. And um, we like to blame others. We do. We, I say we because I'm part of them. Yeah. We like to blame others to make ourselves feel good. So, and when we feel good, we want to be like them. Yeah. Because it's like they don't make, we don't see their mistakes. You know, we cover it up. It's just because we see ourselves as inferior to them, to sadly, because uh, we are not. Because of historical, sorry, historical events, I think we've naturally looked at the whole idea, well, victims of looking at the white saviour, mm -hmm. just like in most other African um, countries, we depend on the outside world to help us to, to be validated to some extent. So yeah, I think we do kind of look at white people in that way subconsciously and it does come down to being conscious of it and then wanting to unlearn some of those natural yeah. attachments to white supremacy sis you know like oh she's being fire good you assume that it's a white thing rather than it's just a good thing and anyone can do it so i think at the back of our minds especially with our in our context in lingala it's like Ilogamundele seems to be something that's better or works well in comparison to us yeah so to that extent, yeah. I wouldn't want to call it an obsession, though. More so a dependency. Yeah. We definitely have something with white people. Because to us, when we think about white people, one of the first things that pop up in our mind is um, history. Yeah. The colonial past. What has happened in the past, as well as what is our relation with them now. Yeah. So, us running to them, I think we cannot put that in a general form. Every person got their own way of viewing that very same situation based on what they experienced with white or let's say European have been so far. Yes, there's some history there that need a form of dealing with, let's say. What kind of problems do we run to them for? Well, we come over here yeah. when our countries move down, so that's one example. Um, I don't think we blame them, but obviously they colonize us. Before they came into our land, we were fine. We were not moving to, from one place to another. But the fact that they came, they already opened that door that you can, it's okay to move from one place to another. They Before Europeans came to Africa, Africa nobody traveled. We were not the savage that they portray us to be, okay? We traveled before they came. You know, we moved around. The story, the history that we know now is what they've written for us to tell us that we were savages, that we never traveled, we didn't do anything, we were not civilized. That's not the truth. So they did not open the, the doors to traveling. 
you know, it, it's always been there. That's, it's a human nature to travel. So to say that, you know, they open a door for us to travel and tell us that it's okay for us to move around, that's, that's, that's wrong. It's, it's not right, okay? Into a country too, for diamond, gold, whatever, where can we move for better education? As long as you can afford to move, you can move. It's a free country, it's a free world, you're free to move. It's human right. Yes, we do. I've seen it in the Congo, I've seen it in Kinshasa. Yes, we do. We think white is right, which is not. Absolutely. You know? We think that, you know, the white culture, Mundele culture, you know, it's like, it's superior mm. to our culture, to the African culture. Um, I also, I'm a... F I, it's um, and I, I I do think it's quite sad because we have a rich culture in in, in Congo, and I I do think it's really you know it's quite sad the way Congolese are put, you know the white organization or even the the, the, the you know the white institution the white man right they put it before themselves and they think that the white man is more intelligent than them you know, which is completely wrong. Absolutely wrong. You know, it's just that Europeans have more access, you know, to, to further whatever it is. They so they have more access, and what they do with their access is they start to feed us, you know, their idea of what they want us to think about ourselves and how they want their people, like they want other white people who are not in the same positions to think of us. So it's all about, it's all about having access, like she said. You know, they have the access, they have the ability to manipulate everybody else, so we kind of just fall into the same umbrella and be manipulated and accept that yes, maybe we are below them, maybe we are inferior to them, which is not wrong, it's not correct. I mean, it's not correct, it's wrong. What am I talking about? That, that's, that's my personal view. And I think in Congo, we don't really have that much access, you know, and hence the reason why we are very limited. Yeah. Yeah, I think if we're honest with ourselves, and we're gonna be really, really honest, we definitely do have a white obsession. It's not so much that we blame everything to them, but we look up to them. We are, they're almost like we, we, we are looking for approval, validation. Approval, yeah, like validation. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, it's always been like, I, I didn't really understand it because I never really grew up with that mindset until I kind of came into this, um, into Europe. But that's so, the thing though. We only really experience racism and all that differences when we come to Europe. Because when you grow up in Africa, you're just a human being. I mean, you know about the races. You know you're black. You know there's white people. You know there's, you know, red, Asian, or whatever. They're, all those races exist. But you don't look at yourself in the mirror and go, oh, my God, I'm black. That happens the moment you come to Europe or, you know, just leave Africa. People start pointing a finger at you and pointing out that you are different. So that is, quite frankly, it's, it's a European mindset. It's not African, it's not ours. I don't understand why I need to get validation from people who had to enslave you yeah. in order to make you do what they wanted you to do, uh, or even try and look like them, because I've always grown up with the concept that I look good, you know, and my skin was great, so... Until you come here, they start telling you different. Again, I think it depends on a lot of things. Auntie? Uh, you will always find people who is another uh, a white man uh, is the reason for all why they are such a failure um, why Africa is where it is today why Europe is so beautiful Africa is where it is today because of the white man okay Yes, a lot happened in the past. A lot. Which caused Africa to be where it is. We cannot deny that. Mm -hmm. But with that said, it's time for us to stop using that as an excuse. To just be lazy. We can't keep saying, you know what, why people did this to us. So, you know, we have the excuse to do this and that. that we can't do this because, because we've run out of excuses. Eventually, we have to run out of excuses. We have, it's time for us to just like, you know what, accept it. Shit happens. They did what they had to do to survive, and now what are we gonna do to survive? We cannot accept this position that we are in right now, like, you know, we're in the bottom of the barrel. Knowing that they did what they did,
to be where they are right now. So now we are where we are now. What are we going to do about it in order to get out of the position that we are in? So, yeah. I think now we can come to terms that yeah. we have so many African intellectuals today to change that. Yeah. Um, today, I can't agree uh, to... I can't agree... I can only agree uh, to a certain level to that statement. Because... Unless I'm mistaken, up to today, the white, I find it difficult to say it like that, but white, European. Since they call us uh, black, we, we're we black, they're white. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, sorry, auntie. Yeah. <laughs> to permanently. Little, but it goes under that um, I tarnish as um, patronized. We've patronized us for the longest time. But then so. again, we can say, why don't we do the same? We don't need to do we the can same. Do the same today. We don't need to do the same. We don't need to enslave white people. We need to fight for ourselves. We need to basically separate ourselves from the, mind, from the sl mental slavery that we are in today. We need to separate ourselves from the idea that we were slaves. Because before we became slaves, we were kings and queens. We had everything. We, you know, we, were, we were leaders. So the slave mentality came afterwards. So what we need to do is separate ourselves from that idea that we were once enslaved people. We were once below you know, the idea of you know, white is better. So we need to just separate ourselves from that mentality. And it, it's not about wanting to be better than white people or wanting to be equal to white people. Wanting, it's about wanting to be our own people because we are ourselves. We need to just separate ourselves from them. So instead of trying to mix ourselves, be, like, you know, becoming like them or becoming better than them, why don't we just bring our own table, you know? Bring our own table. Make our own stuff. Be our own people because we are different. Be our own people. Okay, auntie. Talk. Why are we... In the receiving end, why are we paying attention to it? Why are we so small minded? It is, it depends on individuals, it depends on choices. Like I said earlier, we have so many intellectuals in Africa today. We do. And I know it goes with African politics. Who are not quite paving the way for the citizens to um, yeah not making things so easy as well even for those intellectuals but it will have to be our own willingness to change those say today I say to you yeah Charlene you're so dark I like how she says Charlene. <laughs> Such a common pronunciation. So what? It's only a matter of color. Why do we have to take it because we call it black? We take it as an insult. Why don't they take it an insult when we call them white? I don't think many of us take being called black as an insult. What we take as an insult is, you know, everything else that comes after that. You know, everything else that they decide it's an insult to us, we decide it's an insult. For example, the N-word. They view it as an insult to us. And we, when we hear it, we take it as an insult. It hurts us be just because they view it as an insult to us. So if they want to call us black, and you know you're black, the race is black, I'm black. Then I should also be, it should also be okay for me to address you as white because... I'm black, you're white. It's as simple as that. So you know, it's, I don't think it's about being, you know, calling it it's an insult or whatever. It's about, you know, owning ourselves, accepting us for who we are and just running with it, basically. 
us I think also we need to change our mentality as well I do feel yes we do because I feel like we are allowed the white people to come to our country to use us and we didn't allow nobody to come in our country and use us they came by force okay we didn't allow them we don't use we're not I don't think we are why we, we use our intelligence to actually understand these people actually use us because without us our country and Congolese without us they won't be nowhere why people wouldn't have half of the things that they have because most of the things that they have comes from our country yes cotton all those things that they use te technology is from our country but then we blame the white people for using us but it's our fault it's our own intent we need to be smart enough knowing that these people are using us how about Congo because Congo is one of the richest countries in the world how mm -hmm. can Congo be one of the richest country and yet still one of the poorest country it's all about systematic manipulation okay they use the people that are in the in the dire the direst opposition, like you know the most suffering situations, and you know bring you bread. You know you dig that, I'll give you bread, and you dig a bunch of diamonds. What are you gonna do with a bunch of diamonds? You're not gonna eat it. It's not gonna you know you don't know what to do with it. So you give them so they can give you bread. They know exactly what they're doing. They're manipulating us, and with that is that's why you don't see a lot of Africans going to school because. They provide, they're preventing that from happening, you know, in a way that, like, let's just say if you go to places like um, Kivu, for example, where all these things, these things happening, there aren't really schools, kids aren't really going to school, the youth aren't really encouraged to study because there's so much poverty, they think, I want to work so I can provide for my family. They're forgetting that, you know, going to school, you don't have to go. It's not about your university. It's about, you know, having the basic level of education. because That's what opens your mind. And if you don't have that, then you can't really fight for what you, you know, what's yours because you don't have the resources. You don't know where to begin. So they want to keep you in a position where you don't know where to go or who to talk to. So you just, you know, you're stuck in a limbo. So there's nothing you can do. So it's not that we're letting them. We just don't know what to do because they're blocking everything. Because we allow these people to come into our country, they stole what we have, and we run to this country, and we still face certain things that feel like if we wasn't smart enough to be back home, we wouldn't be suffering like this. What would you class yourself as, a migrant or an immigrant, or an illegal alien? Illegal alien. Uh, I'm an immigrant. Quite simple. I move from one country to another. I'm here, and I plan on going back. I have no intention of, you know, spend the rest of my life in the UK. I came here for a reason, and once it's done, I'm gonna end. Clearly, I know I'm not that welcome here. So when it's done, when I'm done with my education, with you know, my work, gather what I need together, I will go back home. I'm not an illegal alien anywhere, yo. So I'm not an alien. So, I don't know, maybe I am, you don't know. <laughs> but yeah, okay. Would you class yourself as a migrant, an immigrant, or an illegal alien? Uh, migrant, no, immigrant. Because I feel like, for me, I moved back home to come and live here permanently. So, so when I moved, I had no intention of going back home to leave. Wait, is that what immigrant mean? Moving back? with no intention of going back. I don't know. If that's what it means, then I would say migrant because I have every single intention of going back home. So I don't think I actually know exactly the difference between migrant and immigrant, but for me is I'm here and I will go back. So I'm not here for the rest of my life. That is not my intention. So, um, yep, back to it. I will go back home. But I wouldn't be like, I would leave there permanently maybe because of how um, I've grown up here. But I still feel like I'll still go back home to build things in Congo and have okay. to make Congo one country of the great, one great country. I am... I, no, I, I don't class myself as any of that because I am the population of Earth. Okay. Just like the cockroach is a population of Earth. Right. The antelope, 
the lion. I'm a population of Earth. So I belong to Earth. If I go to London, I belong to Earth. If I go to Congo, I belong to Earth. I was born in Congo. They're from Congolese, but I belong to Earth. You were born in Congo, but now you're living in England. So what does that make you? It's a simple question. Okay, I'm gonna go back to <laughs> Alien. None of those. I just class myself as a human being. Just, just okay, but guys, that was not the question. Could you just answer the question, please? <laughs> Indigo alien. It's an old term for climate um, monstrosity. It's another old stranger. Yeah. Mm. Are you mad? I don't know what. The differences are per se, but I I would say immigrant based on my family history, um, or more so refugee, really. Um, not sure how those three kind of work technically, if I'll be honest. But refugees are an identity that I, I I remember feeling like it was just who we were it's ever since I can remember. So yeah, I come from somewhere and I moved. Mm -hmm. to a few places now those terms migrant immigrant to me they're just words to try and define certain concepts yeah yes if I've been through the migration process yes because I've moved from A to B in that sense yes I dislike the word illegal alien because alien looks like something that shouldn't be in the place where it is. Uh, when I went to China, there's a boarding card and it says alien shouldn't work in China. So when I saw that, I was like, who is an alien? And I looked at myself, I am not an alien. I'm not from a different world. We are all from the same world. So illegal alien? Never. Um, I think I, I would say I'm an immigrant. Um, because... Um, I'm an immigrant and a migrant. And what was the other one? Immigrant, migrant, illegal alien. I'm a long-term illegal alien. Yeah, okay. I'm a immigrant because when I grew up in Germany, I grew up still knowing that I'm different than them. And I still had to adapt to their ways. I still had to learn their language. I still had to kind of integrate it into their culture. So that makes me an immigrant. <coughs> and... My mom made sure that I knew that I was different, so I had to behave, you know, to, sh to outshine everyone else. So that's, that's the reason why I'm an immigrant, because I still had to adapt. And I'm a migrant to the UK because I made the decision from myself um, to move, to leave my comfort zone, to leave Germany and come to the UK. I don't see myself as a migrant. I don't see myself as any of the... I just see myself as a citizen of the world. Why are we avoiding the question, please? You know, I don't... Yes, uh, yes, I did come here at the, uh, you know, young age. And when I came here, I couldn't speak English at all. You know, so I, I think at that time, I felt like, you know, a migrant. And it has changed, weirdly enough. It has changed throughout the years, me being here and also traveling and traveling a lot as well and um and you know i i, I just think i'm a citizen of the world and okay I, I i get this and we're all citizens of the world you know we we move from one place to another but the question is migrant immigrant illegal alien it's as simple as that we could just answer the question we can't we don't need to evade the question going you know i'm a citizen of the world or you know i'm a human being we all are human beings we're all citizens of the world we all belong to earth but it's just about answering the questions you know straight to the point but we're evading it. Why are we evading it? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I always, I'm always going to, to Congo, but I've seen um, different aspects of human behavior and human life, and I just think we are all the same. We yeah, are. We just speak but still, we're not. And we're just in different countries, but we all want the same things, and we are all the same. So I don't, um, I don't consider myself as a migrant, to be, to be honest. Maybe someone else, maybe when they look at me, they might think like I'm a, I'm a migrant, but I don't really know. Are Congolese included? Are Congolese people included fairly in the British laws? Nope. We're not. We have never been. And we never will.
because this is not our country. When they create these laws, they create it for the British people, the English people, the people that belong to the land, for the natives. Nobody creates a law in the country thinking about somebody that lives in a different country. Nobody does that. No country does that. So when they create British laws is for the British people, for the English people, for the natives. So they might include, they might include, keyword, include people from the countries that they have colonized. So Nigerians, Ghanaians, South Africans might be included in law when they come here. But as Congolese people specifically, we have no, we are not included whatsoever because as long as British people are, as long as British law is, con is concerned, it's up to France and Belgium to look after us because they colonize us. We speak their language, we are Francophones. So we have nothing here. We only come here, we come here and then it's up to us to survive and just, you know, adapt and find our way in here. But there is no place, quite frankly, for a Congolese person who, is, who was colonized by a French-speaking country coming to England and expecting, you know, to be included in a law. It, it, no, we're not included in British laws. Quite simply, we're not. You know, maybe now they'll start to consider us because, you know, they'll consider us as black people, not as Congolese people. As black people, we will be considered because we're more vocal about situations that we're experiencing now. So based on that, they might start to include us. May, it, may it start to consider us, but Congolese people, no. No, we're not included. <laughs> no. Yeah, we're not. I, I don't think there's, I don't know a lot about British laws. I know a little bit about German laws, but um, no, I don't think it was written for Congolese. No, no, it wasn't. I don't think it was written for the black people. It nope. was written for those who were here when it was written, and I don't believe there was a lot of black people in the UK in these days. I don't even think if Irish that Irish people are included in it. Yeah, if you're British, you're British. So the law should apply to you. How can you be? <laughs> How can you be included in if we that's if that we was included into the British uh, system, whatever? Uh, why are we? Why are we here suffering? Because we're here, we're still here working like slaves. When they're taking things from us. I think black people, we need to learn to separate ourselves from, uh, you know, the idea of. You know, I'm in this country, I've adapted, now I belong here. We don't. Because no matter how much they accept us or embrace us, they will never look at us as part of their community, or part of themselves. It's, it's just, it's the reality. I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but it's, you know, yes, we can integrate, we can, you know, adapt and everything, but they will still look at us as them, we we'll still be us and them. It's always going to be like that. So we need to be able to, if they can separate that, if they can look at us as different to them, we, we should be able to, to do that as well and separate ourselves and just look ourselves as different. That We need to be able to do that. Because right now, so far, we're not. We think if we come here, we become them. But we don't. We don't become them. We are not the same. You know, it's, we need to be able to, to, to separate that. Basically, we are here working when our country people in our country are suffering. So, how are we included? How are we treat it fairly? Interesting. No. No. Okay. The first thing that, that will come to my mind in regard to that question is that did they make those laws for Congolese people? No, they did not. Nope. If they did and the laws designed or made do not fit the Congolese people, that's one thing. But at the end of the day, those laws are made primarily to sue and accommodate the natives the of the land first. Yes. And the Congolese people come to fit in the secondary. They know the main focus is like saying 
the medal lows and hopefully the Congolese might find something for them. There's nothing hopefully. They made a lot if you fit in, you fit in. If you don't, you don't. They, they don't even hope for us to fit in anything. Always have. God, that sounds so radical. Do I? Damn. Gee. Like Oof. Just because we come from Congo, as a black woman, just a small example, as a black woman, go today, go to the GP, ask for a service, ask for something, and see how long it takes for you to be attended. Just, just do that. I mean, I don't know, man. It, this is just... Okay. ...your work and get the job that you deserve based on your qualification, not your no, race. No, no. Then that's fine. We don't do that, though. They don't do that. They don't give us jobs based on our qualifications. They don't do that. Because... They do not give us jobs based on our qualifications. When you send your CV to an employer, first thing they look at is your name. They read your name. They see Jean Simulumba. They know you're not English. They're not even going to look at your qualification. They put a CV aside and they're going to look for a, a Bethany Smith. You know, it, it's just... It's fact. I'm sorry, but it's fact. You do not get jobs in England because of your qualifications. That happens later on. You know, you can... With what happens with black people is you start climbing. Yes, some of us do get jobs because of our qualification, but it's very few. The majority of us, people look at your name and they set you aside. They're waiting for you. I mean, how long does it take? One example, you graduate university with a friend. You know, you've got the exact same qualifications. You're both, you're both looking for jobs. If you're black and your friend is white, your friend will get a job before you. It's a fact. I have an example. When I was um, 16, 17, I applied for this job in Poundland, and they told me they were looking for more people. If I had friends, I could, uh, you know, invite my friends to apply. I invited a friend. My friend sent the CV. You know what? My friend got the job. I didn't. You know what that was? Because... They did not look at my qualifications, even though I was more qualified than her. It, it was not, you know, that I applied first. It was like, you know what, she's black, she's white, we'll hire her. It's just as simple as that. It's fact. So we need to learn to accept that as well. It sucks, of course. And maybe we don't want to accept it because, you know, because you know, we're all supposed to be the same and everything like that, blah, blah, blah. But these things exist and we need to accept it. Okay. I think we're non-existent. In the British law, I, it's not even. I don't even think. I, I think companies. We're not. We're nowhere near. Nowhere near. We're no, nowhere near the British law, the British constitution. I don't think even Africans are. Full stop. Yeah. You know, um, no, not at all. Um, not at all. I mean, I think <laughs> we're not included in anything. Even in, you know, we're lacking in Parliament. There's no one. There's no MP. In, in Parliament, because you know I, I go to Parliament and there's no one there. Oh, you're from Congo. Oh, oh, okay. There's no one there. Yeah. There's no one in major institutions. You know. You might find people from the francophone country. You, you can you can find a Nigerian, Nigerians, Ghanaians, which is really important. South Africans, really but Congolese. To have a, to rep to have a rep representation. Not in England. Of a Congolese person in politics in this country. You know, I think it will be, I think it will, it, I, I don't know if it will make it easier, but I think they will kind of have a bit more respect for us. Yeah. And they will consider our, um, our issues that's happening in the Congo. Yeah, much more yeah? seriously. They will be yeah. more considerate. But because we don't have a face. So they don't part, care, exactly. Hence the reason why we are forgotten. We are invisible. You know? That's it. <laughs> Congolese cannot be included fairly in any law if the system around the world was created by Europeans. So if you look at even the system in Congo was created mm -hmm. by Europeans, so it's just not going to be fair that you deconstruct that. You see? 
um, the law here in England was never... I mean, be even when you go to goddamn Congo, you go to, like, the major shops, the major places, like, you know, hotels. I mean, who are these people? Who are the first faces you see? It's white people. It was just very sad, but... I mean, Congo being the country it is, there is a, we are, it's like it's a battle for Congolese people because the whole world is looking at that one country to develop the rest of the world. So we are in a position that, I mean, <laughs> it's difficult, but we need to wake up and just think, okay, this is our country. We need to realize just how important our country is in the development of the world. So once we know that, truly then we can start taking drastic steps because we need to take drastic steps because everybody else is taking steps for us. Everybody else is doing things for Congo whilst we just, we're just sitting behind and watching the world go by. It, it, I mean, our country is being taken from us right under our noses and we're not doing anything about it. I think I'm moving into a different topic now. Back to this. Um, races have been coming in. Uh, the first races, the Asians, that were, were invited here, the laws, they had to fight for their laws, pay lobbying, mm -hmm for the laws to be changed, and those laws ain't even many, you know, for them to advance. Uh, in order for Africans to get anything like that, you would have to do what they did, you know, lobbying people to get in there and force laws to be changed. But why force laws in a continent that doesn't like you in the first place when you can just go and do your own thing in your own? Yeah, exactly. And, and focus the effort there. So no, the laws are not for us. They were never for us. We don't need to change it. We just need to go back and make our own, own, in our own countries. We can go and change it for our own continent and fix that so we can then be just like Europe with our own land mass. Do you think yes. the average English person Do you think the average English person is racist to migrants knowingly or unknowingly? I think the average British person is racist and they know it. However, they do not want to admit to it. They don't want to acknowledge that they're racist. They will do anything and everything to avoid, you know, just taking responsibility that what you're doing is racist or what you said is racist. They will do anything to go against that. But let's just go for, with a simple example, recent, Meghan Markle. How was Meghan Markle treated in the UK? We all know how she was treated. And it's you know, for no reason whatsoever. They would come with all these nonsensical reasons. But for everything Meghan was criticized for is the exact same thing that Kate Middleton did. However, when it came to Meghan, it was, oh, it's not racist. We just don't like her, but why don't you like her? There was no, really reason, there was no real reason why they did not like Meghan Markle. But, you know, whenever you say you're being racist, they'll say, stop putting the, the race card. Okay, maybe I stop putting the race card, but give me an example. Give me a reason why exactly you hate the woman. Nobody had a reason. They would not accept that they're being racist, but they will still, you know, kind of degrade you and, and insult you without wanting to admit that they're being racist. So yes, the typical, the average English person is racist, but denies the fact, would do anything to deny that they are. <laughs> so many are. Racist knowingly. Knowingly, with the one, the made to it. Personally, I've been a victim of that so many times. We all have. But I have a mindset of looking at that person. For me, when you're being racist to me, I pity you. Because to me, you don't understand. First of all, you don't understand historical fact. Mm -hmm. You're not intelligent. Damn as I'll be racist. You look damn as I'll be racist. You need to understand that there's no black, there's no white, there's no red. We're all one race, first of all. We are all human beings. Yeah? Yes. And then also, the fact that history tells us that we were once all black, it is just um, an evo evolutionary Evolution. factor that made some become white. So having that in mind, why would I then think I'm superior to you because you're white or 
you are superior to me because I'm black. I don't get it. Um, knowingly and unknowingly. You know. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, I have situations where you know I I'm, I'm, I met a, a person and as soon as they saw my my surname, oh Kalanga, said, "Where are you from?" I said, "I'm I'm I'm, I'm from Congo," and he was like. Oh, but you're British. I'm like, wow, okay. You, you, yeah, but the way you speak, you, you, you're one of us. You're not like the Nigerian. And then she, and then she, and he pointed uh, a Nigerian who, who literally just came and who had the African accent. And then I looked at him and I said, um, but do you know I was a refugee? I couldn't speak a word of English when I came here in, in the 90s. You know? Um, so I am her. 20 years back. But well, that's the thing with British people or this European. They want to once, they want to m make you like themselves. You know, once you speak like them, you dress like them, you talk like them, then you write, then you like them, and you accept. It. But as long as you're different, as long as you still have your African accent, as long as you you, you wear your Afro hair, as long as you dress your you know, your 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 African clothing, they look at you as somebody different. And this is what rise from the mentality of white is right and black is wrong because you only accept into white community if you start to sound you start to sound like them. If you start to look like them, then they accept you. So that is racist. It's plain and simple, it's racist. Like, oh wow, that's yeah. You know, and I think it's wrong. Um, the way you are, you know, so, so it, it was kind of racist. Kind of? I don't think I don't know if he knew that he was racist, mm, but you okay. know, I had to. And then, yeah, subconscious. And then when I did present to him the way that I did, and he was like, "Oh, you're right." I said, "Yeah, you're speaking to someone who was an immigrant. You're speaking to someone who was a refugee who came here at a very young age. You know, I, I'm speaking like you're speaking. When you're when I'm speaking, mm. I, you can identify with me because of the accent, of course, because of the British accent." Because of my mannerism, you know, because we have so much in common as a as a British person here. Because obviously I've adapted to the culture, you know, and I've integrated. But my history, I'm a, a migrant. To your eyes, to, to to society's eyes, I'm a migrant. You know, because I come from a different country. You know what? When it comes to England, I think they're not really racist. They're more discriminative. They're trying to and hide I'm behind I'm from, smiles I'm, I'm and shit. Germany. So I see racism. I know racism. I can feel racism. And but that's the thing. Racism is no longer just blunt and physical. It, and right now, especially in England, it's very, very subtle. They will do it, you know, like in a way where you can't really see it happening. You can't really sense it, but it's there if you pay attention. So yes, it's not just about them being, you know, discriminative, but they are racist in a way that it's you can't tell it's there unless you pay really you really pay attention. Then you can start to discover that okay, shit, they did that, they said that, and that's not acceptable. Or they come to you asking to do something that's typically black, but then they come to you with smiles, and then when you turn your back, they start laughing at you. You think oh, they're just laughing because you're but it's it's it's. That's racist, quite simply, and it's, it's you know, yes, it's just, they're just trying to hide behind, you know, oh, it's a joke, it's just a joke, but it's it's not, it's not always a joke, it's it's racist. Feel it sometimes or certain place when you're in Germany, but when you come to England, maybe they they're doing a cover is a makeup, you know, they will embrace you, but then once they have embraced you, maybe in a job or in a company then they would just put borders, you know, they would limit you, they would give, they yes. would give you the full opportunity, you know, so they would then start discriminating you. So I don't believe, and even wherever you live or wherever you go, they will put this fake, you're right, love, <laughs> this fakeness in them where they will not show you that they're, they're racist, but they will show you that you will feel discriminated still, yeah. somehow. Yes, so I wouldn't really call them English people racist. I'll call them more discriminated. They are racist. Um, I've never experienced any sort of racism, but 
if what you're black in England, you've never experienced racism. That's bullshit. I'm sorry, but that's just not right. That's not true. Maybe you're just not wanting to admit to it, but it happens all around you, everywhere you go. You know, it's just about how you deal with it. But you cannot say, if you're a black person who has lived in England for such a long time, you cannot say you have never, ever experienced racism because you will meet people that would either be very blunt to you, racist, or you'll meet people that would be racist under the rug, hiding behind smiles. It's up to you to pay attention. Maybe you've just been ignorant and didn't pay attention to it. But yeah. Hey, then again, it's to experience. I'm not going to speak about experience. So, okay. Maybe you haven't. So if you, if you haven't, really, if you haven't experienced racism in England, I am happy for you, truly. I hope the rest of us would get to, to experience them. I hope that will be the future of the world where nobody or no black person experiences racism in the UK or anywhere else in the world. I hope that is true for you. So if it is, then I'm, I'm happy for you, truly. If you're racist to you, it doesn't mean they have to be the whole group of people doing it. It's well, of course. It's not, individual. It's not about putting people in a box. First of all, why is it when something is, is, you know, to do with white people, we don't put them all in a box as one group? It's always about, not all white people are racist. It's just, you know, I met a racist there. But when it's something to do about black people, it's everybody in the same box. When it's about to do with Muslims, it's everybody in the same box. You know, if a Muslim commits a crime, they're all terrorists. If a black, people, if a black person commits crime, they're all thugs. But if a, black, if a white person commits a crime, it's mental health. It's that specific person. It's ne when it comes to white people, it's always individuality. But when it comes to any other race, it's the whole group of the people. Why is it like that? Of course, it's not everybody. It's not. Of course, it's not like every white person is racist. That's not true. It's it's a fact. It's not true. But when we say about white people being racist, then we we need to be able to just you know talk about it openly without trying to separate it. You know what? It's not all of them that are not racist. I'm sorry. If they can openly call us thugs and call Muslims terrorists, why can we not openly call them racist? I mean, yo. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think looking back now, primary school, secondary school, I think from, especially at a place where now I'm very conscious of some of the dis, um, discrimination, racism, subtle racism. Um, very subtle ones. Because I somehow have this uh, um, assumption in my mind that there is a, a certain level of racism in Britain, but it's very subtle. And because American culture yeah. gets projected to us, you assume that you're just, as, uh, you're just in connection to black struggles in america and really it's something that you're living through every day in the uk it's just very subtle i feel like british culture is very um you can be quite sarcastic or just not to the point no one wants to call it call it out yeah so you kind of you become subtle about it and then subtle about pointing it out as well i had a thing with face with this with the racist i had to feel like us black people living in a white people country we face racism and sometimes they, I think it's not that they don't know I feel like they do know but they just are like they're not conscious or they are like they don't know they just they don't care it's just like, like you know people. what sometimes this know is my country I own it oh, no. it's not racist. I can say what whatever the fuck I want to you and, and there's nothing you can do about people, it we saw people, white people talk the way certain things a white person will say it, has, it, it is actually racist to a black person but us because we're, I would say some of us are ignorant I think they're both the average English person who would start with the ones that are actually racist. The average English person who is actually racist. England, England is one of the best racist countries when it comes to That's racism. a nice way to put it. Because that's true, actually. Because racism in France and Belgium is more in your face than it is in England. I mean, I'm speaking about France and Belgium because I've traveled to this country quite often and I know how, you know, I've experienced things there. But in the UK, it's more, it's more, it's very subtle. You don't really see it there. So some of us might think it's not there, but it is there. Compared to, of course, when you go to, to France and Belgium or Germany, then you experience it more bluntly. 
But yes, England is the the nicest racist country. <laughs> is that true? That's the true statement. I like that. <laughs> what people have yet to understand, especially black people, is that racism has moved from physical racism mm -hmm. to systemic racism. Yes. So now they hide behind what, what they call discrimination or ignorance or lack of knowledge, whatever it is. Yes. The, the spin words. So it's become more smart because, remember, they created racism. So therefore they can recreate it. And which Absolutely. Is exactly they've done again. Yeah. Um, so where it was physical and everyone can see, now they've realized, hmm, because we own the systems, we've created the systems, we can hide behind the systems. And we can paint it as though we're not racist. Yes. And actually, really, we are. Case in point, the prison systems in almost every European country where there's black people holds 80%, you know, yeah. great, uh, black people than it does the native that are, the, you know, the highest population. Yes. Yeah, and the the no, unknowing racist side are, there's two two of them. There's the one that are genuine, and, I, and I've had the pleasure of working with some. I say the pleasure because I've corrected some people, you know, um, in my employments um, year, within the years, you know, just for example, simple words like using the word coloured. As soon as you've oh my them, god, that oh I I've I hate it, really. When white people use the word coloured, or even when black people use the word coloured, because the fuck, come on. What sense does it make to you to address somebody as coloured? And I know people would we use that. Some people use that to avoid trying to use the word black, but. I'd much rather you address me as a black person than a colored person because there's more than one colored person, you know? So if you're looking at me, you're talking to a black person, address me as a black person. And we've had this in a church once, uh, I think I was, I was like 15 or 16, where uh, uh, something happened in the community and this woman went to the church and she was speaking about something that happened. The person that this happened to was a black child and she was talking about the black community and she was like... Um, um, to the, uh, the, the, the colored, the colored community. I was like, sis, just say black, you know, because when you're trying not to be racist, you're actually being racist. So say black. Okay. Just, just say black. We can take that, but don't try to hide behind colored or, you know, even blacks with the S at the end. Don't do that. Say a black person, black people, because we don't say whites. We say white people. So Say it like it is, okay? Don't try to hide behind flowery words. Say it like it is. And you realize that made you feel that way. And straight away they make a change because that's when it's genuine ignorance. But then you have the ignorance that pleads ignorance. They play onto it, you know? But then you, you hear things that comes out of their mouth like, and then you think, oh, so you've been playing on it all along. Yeah. And they're the ones that would have a, um, a mixed race child or... I can't be racist. My child is black. My child is mixed race. I can't be racist. My husband is white. My wife is white. Is black. You know, it's... Dude, whether, you, whether you're married to a white person or a black person or not, or if you have mixed race children, you can still be racist. Okay? And it's up to you to know what you're doing wrong and how you can fix it. So just don't stay ignorant. Don't try to hide behind your family member who's black or your family member who's mixed race. Don't do that. What we're doing now is we're trying to eradicate the racism. We're trying to work towards eliminating it. We're not trying to hide behind the fact that, you know, we're connected or related to people of different races so we can be racist. We can't do that. Okay? Black partner or, you know, and then think, oh, well, I can't possibly be racist because well you know i'm i have a partner or i have a child that is of a, a different race or yeah. mixed race the average person i would say based on my experiences there's racist people there's people that don't know or understand people that seem different to them You can find a bit of both for those two categories I just described. Since being here, uh, have... Since being here, have Congolese people done enough to take 
advantage of the perks they have in the UK? Nope. I.e. building education, industry, jobs, healthcare, support, finance, you know, as the Chinese, the Jews and South Asians have done. No, we have not. Very few of us have. But if we had, we would be in the same position as China right now. But we're not. We're so, so far behind. Because what the Chinese and the Jews have done is they've taken what they've been given, taken advantage of what was provided to them, went back to their homes, went back to their communities, and built and invested in the communities. That's not what the Congolese people are doing. Sadly, the Congolese people is, are more interested in individu individual wealth, you know. It's, I'm rich, I'm going to do this for me. We don't care about, you know, our country or, you know, our neighbors. It's, it, it's, which is very confusing because we are very community oriented. We are very family oriented. So when we get money, why is it that we want to separate ourselves from our community? It makes no sense. It's just, it's, it's, it's nuts. So we need to learn to start investing, not in our individuality, not in our individual selves, but in our community. It's about going back to Congo and building and bringing ourselves together the way the Chinese have done, the way the Jews have done. We need to learn this. We need to learn to do that because right now we're not doing anything. We're not. And it's sad. I think we all have different struggles coming in um, to the country and as a Congolese kind of um, from a Congolese background I can't speak for every Congolese family and every Congolese person coming in but we're, we're a francophone nation sorry francophone colonized trying to, to, to adapt to a British mm -hmm. or an Anglophone system yeah. I feel like that would have had some level of um, you know, disadvantages to the people settling in. But in saying that, I mean, certain things that our parents kind of took advantage of, whether it was, you know, the um, government sort of programs that was there for them. I feel like they tried their best to, like, utilise those education. There's a lot of parents and a lot of young people that, you know, went into edu the education system. So, But can more be done? Yes. I'll be curious to know how many parents have bought homes for instance or how many people were able to like own properties and own businesses i know a lot of people a lot of common people that own properties at home you know they they work here and they buy properties at home but it's all about individuality it's all about the individual it's for me i build that is for me we need to stop that we need to build our country we need to learn to come together we need to be able to talk to our neighbors, you know. I've got this idea, you've got that idea. What can we do together? Even for quartier, quartier Nabiso, tout ton quartier, just one little quartier. Make it better. We need to be able to just communicate with each other. Why don't we have that? We think, you know, I've been to Congo, where I've seen, you know, this poor neighborhood, and then you see this big, massive house. It's the only one there. You know, it's got three stories. It's nice, it's painted, it's like, I mean, you're looking at this place, you know they've got money, or they came, they, you know, they built from money from that they took from Europe. But then the whole, their neighbors are still scrapping for food. It's just, it's, it's nuts. We need to stop doing that. We need to be able to just bring ourselves together, you know? It's, it sucks, and it's sad. I don't know how far we went as a community in terms of migration to that level, but I can't make assumptions up, if that makes sense. This one is, um, it's a bit of a, a I'm a, more empathetic of, of the fact that as much as I blame Congolese for not doing it, they haven't created any of those things at no. all, whether it be education or... Very few have. Uh, or infrastructure or anything. They've got businesses, but they don't, they rent... I mean, America. very few have, like some of our footballers, uh, basketball players, like, What's the, this guy, the Mutombo uh, Dikembe? You know, he's done something, which is good. So we need to have more of that. So we need to have more of our people from the Western world going back and building there, you know? 
Muto Bodike me has in hospital. You know? I need to hear of more Congolese um, footballers, Congolese basketballers, Congolese you know, business people going back to Congo and building for the community, you know, building schools, building hospitals, building orphanages. We need to do that. We, need to, we can't just wait on the government to do these things for us because the government is not doing anything. I mean, just one of our biggest hospitals, Mamayemo, we all know Mamayemo. Look at the state of Mamayemo right now. You cannot, now you can't take your family and say, you know, somebody's sick in the family, you're going to take them to Mamayemo. Very few people can do that. Very few people, specifically if you live in Europe, and you know the reality is you're not going to want your family to go to Mamayemo because it's, it's, it's not a good hospital anymore. So if the government is not doing it, then we as a community, we need to come together and do it. Money always never circulates more than one percent of yeah. the time. Ooh, communities. that's one thing. We also spend our money in other communities rather than in our community. A Congolese person would rather buy something from a Jew, from a Chinese, from an Indian, from a Ghanaian, before they buy from a Congolese person. Would rather watch. Hollywood movies, rather than watch a Congolese film, you know, we'd rather just, you know, we are so enamored, interested in everything that's not ours. When all these other communities, I know very few Indians that are, you know, as obsessed with Hollywood as Congolese people are obsessed with Hollywood. You know, most people from the foreign countries that you would know, I mean, it's an example, but I'm pretty sure you would know some people that they, they will watch more things from their country, like Nigerians would watch Nigerian movies. You know, they would support people from their countries. But we don't do that. You know, we only wait until that person is already famous or is already big, is already, you know, doing stuff, stuff so we can say, oh, they're from our country. Yeah, that person from our country. Why do we wait until it's too late? We need to learn to support each other from the beginning, from the bottom. And we don't have that. We don't have that unity. So we need to, 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 to pick that up, okay? Wherever they are. But that's also because when most of us left, if not all of us left uh, our native countries, we came in a desperate situation. So there was never a plan in place to inhabit, uh, in, in, intervene or... Um, integrate into a system it was always a plan of well we're going to stay here until the war ends but then you know suddenly you wake up it's 30 years later and then you realize oh why did i do been waiting for the war to end but it had we should have really done something yeah so there is that sense of complacency but within that complacency as well there is the disconnect between the communities as to what it is that is priority but again, I have to say, I have to empathize because if you're coming from colonialism, slavery, which for us was probably the harshest, um, probably the only second to South Africa, you have been constructed after being deconstructed from your own heritage yeah. to now only know about waiting to be given, waiting to be told when, waiting to be told how, waiting to be led. So all you will ever do is sit there and wait, well... He's going to do it. She's going to do it. Well, that leader should do it. And you'll never really move because you're still pretty much enslaved mentally. Absolutely. No, I'll say no. Because um, language barriers and uh, education, we don't really seek to know. We just settle for what is already there. Yeah. But then when it comes to Indian, Chinese, they put on the work, they research. It's like they learn the system so that that way they can maneuver easily Absolutely. in that country. Absolutely, I agree. But we don't. We just come in. We don't know the language. We so settle we for the what they give us the instead of fighting for more. Basic. Yeah. That's a very interesting question. I have done a work recently on that. Uh, no, we haven't. Congolese people haven't. No. We have found it difficult to integrate within the British society. And that is often to do with... No, I think we have integrated. That's what we do. We do too much integrating. We become part of this community and we forget ourselves. We forget that we came from someone else, from somewhere else. So we do integrate. We do adapt. And we, we kind of just blend in and think we are part of here when we are not. We kind of just go with the flow and then forget 
that we come from somewhere else that we need to to go back home and build home and just you know do something back home we kind of forget that so we in do we do integrate but too much too much so that we so much so that we we forget ourselves you know and that's not pretty is it it's kind of ugly <laughs> with the linguistic uh, fact and cultural as well because you know with Congo Congolese were colonized by Belgium whether we like it or not whether it's today a negative connotation uh, to mention that or it's a fact it happened uh, we were colonized by the Belgians Belgians are closer to French we spoke French yeah. so Coming to UK, um, the Brits have different mentality altogether. The French and the Belgians also are different. There might be oh, occasions, but really yeah. different societies we're talking about here. So while you go to Belgium or France, you will find Congolese who see things, who do things differently who were to actually that able in England. to uh, bide with the society there and do great things we here we had to come here first of all at certain age 40s I like some I came here I was much younger but for some most I would say parents who came here they were probably in their 40s some maybe 50s maybe late thirties, immediately they arrived here, they embarked in a, for us, if you are a father, you turn up in UK alone. Now you're thinking of your wife and children you've left in Congo. Mm -hmm. You now have to start in your approach to, to, to unite with them, basically bring them. And for you to do that, you have to be working day and night. Because remember, you might have left a wife and four, five kids. Uh, while the government here might give you papers, they won't pay the tickets for you to bring them over. Yeah. It's all on you. So, you'll find so many parents did not have time to even go and do those simple ESO courses. The English they learned was perhaps through the children, because children through the shop, uh, shopping process, through watching TV, maybe later they decide, okay, let me do a course. But it's 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 quite different from uh, our brothers and sisters in Belgium and France. So by the time now they realize, maybe I, I want to do something, they're probably late 50s, maybe early 60s, in the eve of their, basically they are about to maybe retire. So... We didn't do much. We have we have not done much. No, we haven't. As a community in the UK, no. Um, I would say no. I don't believe that Congolese have taken full advantage of whatever UK is offering them. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason for for me saying no is because I believe that the Congolese people leaving when they left Congo, they left. They didn't just leave Congo, but they left Congolese people. Yeah. I mean, they left everyone behind and said, okay, I'm going to start new on my own. And um, we shouldn't what be they've done like that. is more adapting to the European way and trying to, trying to... We should know that we left the situations in our country. We didn't leave our country. We didn't leave our people. We left the situation that we couldn't live in anymore. So... You're right, Cynthia. I agree with you. Put or throw <laughs> away or just put aside their Congolese way, you know. So they haven't adapted. They haven't. They, ju they just adapted to certain things, but they haven't explored everything that there was there to offer. Yeah. You know, and again, it's this leopard, at least a lizard thing, you know, where a leather goes on something that's red and it becomes red but uh, it, it doesn't become the stone it doesn't 
it doesn't utilize the whole space or if it goes into the shadow it would just you know make itself comfortable enough for it not to be burned by the sun or something like that and i think this is really the best way for for us to see ourselves you know congolese people are sometimes chameleon, chameleon exactly you know they adapt <laughs> no, i don't think so of course if we have even though i know that if we had some of the things that happened in congo wouldn't be happening right now so I just feel like True. us Congolese people, we actually need to stand up together and be united and work together to build the Congo, which is a great country, to tell instead of coming here and actually being used to work to actually work as slave and then back home was what are we doing? Because our kids are still on the roads in Congo. Yeah, yeah. If we really came here and take advantage of the what the system gives us, why are we not? We need to stop wasting money on Gucci's and Louis Vuitton and, and whatever those brands are. We need to stop wasting money on those. Okay? You make money, invest that money. Go back home. Build something. Stop wasting money on, on Mazantomo. I don't know if you still wear that, but stop wasting money on that kind of stuff. Please stop it. Just stop. You don't need to wear a, a Christian Louboutin and your shoe, you know, red sole shoes. You don't need that. It's not going to take you anywhere. You, can, you can't afford it. Literally, we can't afford it. Yes, you have got money. You know, you can pay for it. Just because you can pay for it doesn't mean you can afford it. There's a lot more things that we can do other than just, you know, buying ourselves expensive luxury clothes. We can do luxury afterwards. Right now, we can't do that. We can't afford it. Okay. Oh, no. The way Congo is. I don't think Congolese have taken full advantage of what's happening here. No. Full advantage because there are so many opportunities here. They have they have it's not even I would I would say not even thirty percent to be really honest. I think Congolese they are very much in their own bubble. They are very much in their own community. I think Congolese need to venture out a bit more, you know. Um, I see the Asians, the Asians are, you know, when it comes to business, yeah. when it comes to education, they are really out there, you know, and I think Congolese, that we really need to really make an effort. I think it's probably going to be us who are going to... Our generation, us, yeah. Who are going to teach our children to really go out there and, 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 and really, there's so much potential um, in this country and there's so many opportunities to really go out there and really really grab it you know education here is free even going to university they give you a loan you you have no excuse absolutely no None. excuse congolese people do you have no excuse what i know i'm getting a bit emotional about this but you are, you have absolutely no excuse no, no. i always say this you don't need to go to university but the thing about being a university is that it opens a whole new world for you. You know, you get to meet people, you get to see things in a different eye. So you don't need to go to university for a job, for qualifications, but it's just what it does is it opens a new world for you and it opens a mind. So that's one thing we need to think about sometimes. Like, you know what? Yes, you don't need it to survive, but you need it for your heads. You know, just for the sake of advancement, you need to. You don't need to. You should. You should literally, you should. I would say you should. You should aspire to. What matter? You know, education is for if you want to go to university and study. They give you a loan. Even if you've, you've got kids, they will give you. They will even give you money to look after your kids. For goodness sake. And you can take the money and go build a house in Congo, right? Oh shit. Sorry, British people, if you listen to this, I, I didn't say anything. Use every <laughs> opportunity. They don't, they don't use every opportunity. Home office, they don't watch this, please. Thank you. You can get a loan to start a business in this country. There's so much training that you can do. Yes. You know? That's all I'm going to say because I don't want to. I really, you know, instead of you just sitting at home doing nothing instead of you just sitting at home and watching my booking, i get you sis you know, i know exactly you how you just, feel you know spending your whole day drinking you know and talking absolute nonsense on social media gossiping so talking about music do, you know there's you know books to read. even if you don't want to go to university there's books you can self-education you yes. can educate yourself you know yes 
it's it's just uh, one more talking it like i'm in church <laughs> yes yeah, sis preach she's right amazing amazing right guys so that will be all you see this is the kind of shows we need to have more because we need to have these kind of conversations more often we need to talk about you know we need to discover where we are as a community in the diaspora we need to discover that because we are so um what's the word Eparpillé. we are everywhere you know and we come from a country that is so united and then the moment we step out of it we become so separated why do we do that we need to be able to find ourselves and come together and work together and just discover okay what can we do because we are not from here. We need to go back to where we came from. And, 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 and that's the only way we're going to survive. Not just as black people, but as Congolese people. We need, we need to do that. So um, please watch this documentary and, and give your feedbacks. And also, if you want to, you can do a reaction video. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing part two and part three and part four and five and six. I hope it goes on forever. Because I like to have this kind of conversation. I like to see people talking about this. Because what it does is, is it opens your mind. You know, it, it makes you see far. It makes you think. So that will be all. And uh, I'll see you again next time with another reaction video from hopefully another Congolese um, docuseries or a Congolese show or something. Maybe you might get another film reaction, another trailer. I don't know. Depends on how I'm feeling. Please subscribe if you like, if you like this, subscribe and like and comment. Um, I feel like I'm begging, but I am begging you. Please. <laughs> okay, bye.